we have big solar flares, many solar storms, and some fast solar wind. Those stories and more in the news this week. If you want to learn how weather from our star causes impacts at the Earth that shape the future of our world, join professors Dr. Jenny Meehan, Michael Cook, and myself as we guide you through a space weather certificate program like no other. To enroll in the space weather and environment science program offered at Millersville University, go to millersville.com edu slash swen. It's weather for the 21st century. This forecast also sponsored in part by CW Ops. Space weather this week has gotten so busy it's hard to know where to put your eyes. As we take a look at our Earth-facing disk, we were watching this corona hole expecting some fast solar wind from that and possibly some aurora, but it was a bit of a fizzle since this uh, fast wind didn't ramp up very quickly. Meanwhile, we are looking at this filament here. We've watched it erupt. That was a non-Earth-directed solar storm eruption. Now we've been watching this little filament and on the 6th, it erupts in like a poof. Wait for it. You'll see it right here. Whoosh. Do you see that? And that is a slightly Earth-directed solar storm, but it's mainly going to go north of Earth. Then we were watching this filament over here. But prior to that, Region 3513 really woke up and pow, right there, it fires an M2.3 class flare and gave us a bit of a radio blackout in the Western Hemisphere. Then right afterwards, whoosh. Do you see that? That's a big filament eruption that's gone east of Earth. So the, the sun is mainly giving us a lot of eye candy. Speaking of, we had this gorgeous filament eruption. You can see it here in Suvi. Look at that thing. Gosh, that's beautiful. But once again, not Earth directed. So meanwhile, we've just kind of had a lot of filaments all over the disk, but not a lot of action Earth-wise. So now we turn our sights to coronal holes. You can see this big, long, finger-like coronal hole here. This one is going to be giving us some fast solar wind on around the 10th. It also is going to be met with that one mini solar storm that was going to kind of lead into it. So that could give us a little bit of a push. Plus, we pow, right there, we actually had another mini solar storm launch. So that one is going to be on the, the heels of this fast solar wind. And that could give us a little bit of an enhancement as well. On top of that, as you see this coronal hole here over in uh, the east limb of the sun, there's also this filament underneath it. This filament erupts and it actually looks like it's going to elongate this coronal hole. So that causes that to grow a little bit, which may mean even more fast solar wind for us in about a week or so. So there's a lot of stuff going on. On top of that, we had region 3511 wake up and on the 8th, you can see it right here. Bam! Right there, it fires an M5.5 class flare. This is a big radio blackout. It doesn't last very long, mainly in the Asian Pacific. But since then, it's actually fired off another couple small M class flares. So we're definitely watching this region for more activity. It's going to keep the risk for radio blackouts high and also the chances for solar storms high along with region 3513. And now switching to our M flare and dayside radio blackout threat meter, you can see the X-ray flux has been sitting around the seafloor over this past week until about the 5th when region 3513 began to rotate into Earth view. We started rising in, in X-ray flux as well as solar flux and popping those M class flares at the R1 level radio blackout. And this has been kind of ongoing until about the 8th when region 3511 woke up and Bam! You can see that big M5.5 class flare. That uh, solar flare was only a short-lived one, and it looks like we're going to continue to have these little short pop, pop, pops. So don't expect long-duration radio blackouts, but, re uh, but definitely ones at the R2 level are possible over the next few days before this region begins to rotate to the sun's far side. And then things may calm down just a little bit, but the big uh, radio blackouts are not going to be leaving anytime soon because we have some new regions that are going to rotate into Earth view over the next few days. 
Switching to our solar storm conditions, we were pretty quiet until BAM! We got hit by that big solar storm on the 1st. You can see it actually bumped us up to G3 levels for a little while. In fact, it gave us some decent storming over the course of a day and gave us some gorgeous aurora over many parts of the world. But then, since then, things kind of quieted down and we were expecting to get hit by some decent fast solar wind and bump us back up to storm levels. But look at this! All we ended up getting was just a little bit of uh, unsettled to maybe active conditions and that kind of lasted for a few days and then things just kind of settled down and got even more quiet and now we're really sitting at unsettled to quiet conditions these conditions will likely last until about the 10th when we get hit by that next uh, bit of fast solar wind from that other coronal hole that's going to be rotating in through the earth strike zone and it's going to be sandwiched by those mini solar storms one ahead of it and one after it so that could bump us up possibly to active conditions maybe even storm levels at high latitudes. So aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you definitely could get some more aurora. Aurora photographers at mid latitudes, well, you might need to sit this one out. And during this recent G3 level solar storm that we had back in early December, there were so many aurora photos pouring in, I couldn't keep up with it all. It is very clear that our aurora reporting community has grown by leaps and bounds, and with the camera sensitivities, along with photography skills that are just unparalleled, some of these aurora views have been absolutely mesmerizing. Now, I can't share all of them with you today, but I'll share just some to give you an idea of how many places and how many people saw aurora all over the world. Like this gorgeous shot from Norway. And aurora was seen in Scotland. It was also seen in Norfolk in the UK. And it was seen as far south as Mongolia. It was also seen in China. And clear down to Japan. And as we travel across to the Western Hemisphere, there were a lot of places that had heavy clouds and a full moon that kind of got in the way. But Aurora still managed to poke through that and compete with all of that brightness. And here's a beautiful example in Quebec. And Aurora was seen in Manitoba. And in Saskatchewan. Amazing colors in Saskatchewan. And as we dip down into the United States, of course, vibrant uh, shows were seen in Alaska. But it also reached New England. And we saw some gorgeous views in Wisconsin. We also saw aurora reach as far south as Nebraska. And it reached as clear far south as Texas. And as we got dipped down under, with the beginning of the solar storm had an explosive display, and all those people down under got the best of it. In fact, there were gorgeous views in New Zealand. It was seen in many places in New Zealand. And it was seen as far north as Perth, Australia. So what else does our sun have in store for us this week? Well, we can no longer use Stereo A imagery in order to view the far side of the sun because it's looking at the front side of the sun just like we are. So we have to simulate the far side of the sun using HMI and AIA imagery. And as we take a look at the disk uh, on the simulated far side, you can see we have that big cluster of regions that's transiting the far side right now, especially regions 3492 and 3495. They gave us lots of big solar flares. In fact, they may be launching solar storms on the sun's far side. You can see that big halo that we saw uh, from a big solar storm launch that was far-sighted. That may actually be due to that cluster of regions. Now, meanwhile, as we take a look at our JSOC HMI Helioseismology far-sighted viewer, in order to check to see which of these regions are actually surviving their far-sighted passage, we look in the gold region and you can see all the darkness. Those dark spots, especially this dark spot that we've got labeled here that's reasonably new, this region is actually uh, two regions, 35, 15, and 16, that have just emerged on the Earth-facing disk, these regions really just emerged only a few days ago. So we're going to be watching them quite closely to see if they're going to be growing quite quickly. On top of that, we also have region 3504. And you wonder, where did 3504 come from? Well, actually, as we take a look at the disk again, you can see we actually are watching 
Region 3504 growing just before it disappears off of the sun's west limb. So this region has actually been going quite quickly and surviving its far-sighted passage. So we're going to be expecting big things from it. You can see it right there. And also regions 3492 and 3495. They've got some really dark patches in the uh, gold regions. So definitely could get some more big solar flares and some big solar storms as these regions rotate back into Earth view, starting here in about three to four days. Switching to our moon, we are now passing through the third quarter phase on our way to a new moon, with the new moon being on the 13th. So you night sky watchers, if you want to catch those dim objects in the sky, well, now is your perfect chance. And now switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are anticipating the fast solar wind from that coronal hole that's rotating in through the Earth strike zone, and we are expecting that it's going to have a mini solar storm ahead and behind that fast solar wind. So at high latitudes, NOAA is expecting active to minor storm conditions with up to about a 10% chance of a major storm. So aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you definitely could get a bit of uh, a chase here over the 10th through possibly even the 13th before things begin to settle down, and that is good news for you. Now, at mid-latitudes, however, things aren't quite as rosy. We are expecting only unsettled conditions, despite the fact that we still have this same kind of thing going on. But here at mid-latitudes, we only have about a 10% chance of a minor storm, uh, and, and that's going to peak right around the 11th. We might get a little bit of chance of, for activity over the, the you know days prior and after, but only if you're a dedicated aurora photographer should you bother to chase. Now, switching to our solar flare and dayside radio blackout outlook over the coming week, we are sitting in the mid-130s right now for solar flux, and this does mean radio propagation on Earth's dayside remains in the good range. The big issue, of course, is that we've got moderate noise on the bands right now, and that is because of regions 3515 and 3511. But NOAA is keeping us at about a 40% chance of M-class flares. This is at the R1 to R2 level radio blackout, and about a 10% chance of X-class flares, maybe a 5 to 10% chance of X-class flares at an R to 3 level radio blackout. And these uh, levels will probably continue throughout this week, possibly into next week, because we do have those new regions rotating into Earth view, and they are also going to be uh, big flare players, it looks like. So amateur radio operators and emergency responders expect that radio blackouts at the R1 to R2 level will remain on the menu, likely not long duration uh, radio blackouts blackouts, but, you know, enough to kind of be a bit messy for you when you're trying to get some good communications. Now, switching to our radiation storm and polar aviation outlook over the coming week, everything continues to be in the green. We are at the D1 normal range for you aviators, and this is at flight level 360, which is also the S0 quiet range for the rest of us. And we do have a slight risk for radiation storms. This is about a 5 to 10 percent level for an S1 to S2 radiation storm, and that's mainly because of region 3511 that is rotating to the sun's west limb right now. They're likely the chances for radiation storms won't really increase all that much. We're keeping an eye on it. But uh, if you're frequent flyers and you're uh, high, pa high risk passengers, and this includes air crew and you're flying at high latitudes and high altitudes, be sure to check those ICAO advisories often because things could change. But for right now, you're all in the clear. So the space weather this week is being very, very active. We have a ton of things on the sun that's providing a lot of eye candy and a lot of little mini solar storms that are going to the east of the Earth or the west of Earth or even the north of Earth. Sadly, we're not getting any Earth, strong Earth-directed solar storms, but we are getting a bit of fast solar wind. So aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you definitely could get a chase starting right around the 10th into the 11th, possibly even into the 13th before things totally quiet down, and then you'll have to wait for maybe another week or so and get another chance. Now, amateur radio operators and emergency responders, well, you know, we've got a couple big active regions in Earth view that we're paying close attention to, and R2 level radio blackouts are on the menu, but likely they're going to be short bursts and not long duration, which definitely helps with radio communications. So just hang in there as these regions continue rotating across the disk. And now you uh, GPS users, well, you know, we don't have any huge uh, solar storms, so that makes uh, GPS reception a little bit better. And these big radio blackouts do seem to be short duration. So as long as you stay away from the dawn and dust terminators, your GPS reception should be pretty good. I'm Tamitha Scove, the Space Weather Woman. 
Thank you for watching.